So the Edlick Henderson Innovator of the Year. The Edlick Henderson Award is the highest honor bestowed by the Licensing and Ventures Group of the University of Virginia Innovation. In keeping with the expanded program embodied by UVA Innovation, we have, with Dr. Edlick's approval and encouragement, changed the title of this award this year for the first time from Inventor of the Year to Innovator of the Year. This special recognition is for an innovator or team of innovators, each of uh, whose technology has proven to be of notable value to society. The award is named for UVA Professor Emeritus, plastic surgeon and innovator, Richard Edlick, Dr. Richard Edlick, and Christopher J. Goose, and I'm not sure where, what the Goose part came from, Henderson, the 25-year veteran of the privately owned financial services businesses. It's a tribute to their enduring support of and commitment to the university and its faculty innovators. Award winners receive a cash prize and formal recognition at tonight's uh, annual event. It's truly a pleasure for me to introduce this year's Innovator of the Year, the first of these, and for 2012, Dr. Robin Felder. I've known Robin for a long time. The Felders were previously neighbors of ours. Um, Robin's daughter, Cameron, and our daughter, Susanna, went to elementary school together at uh, Venable Elementary School. Cameron is here this evening. And in the very distant past, Robin and I even played adult league soccer together. Do you remember that, Robin? <laughs> I mentioned this past history uh, only to uh, remind myself that I knew Robin in a very different context at that time. And I certainly did not have an appreciation of his many talents that we are celebrating here tonight. Robin will probably not mention this, but he confessed to me in a conversation we had recently that Ever since his early childhood, he enjoyed taking things apart, building things, and blowing things up. <laughs> now, Robin's mother is here with us this evening, and she probably has some good stories about that herself. <laughs> Robin is a truly remarkable individual whose creativity and energy and hard work have enabled him to contribute to the university, the community, and society in a number of ways meeting the criteria for the Edlick Henderson Award many times over. <clears throat> Basically, Robin has been doing technology development, commercialization, problem solving, whatever you want to call it, way before it was a cool thing to do. He's a professor of pathology. He's the associate director of clinical chemistry in the health system. He's the former director of the Medical Automation Research Center. And I'm not going to enumerate all of his accomplishments and all of the companies that he started because, in part because Robin's going to tell us in his presentation about his problem-solving approach to life and the rationale behind a number of the businesses that he started. So we're going to see the timeline and hear about some of these, so I'm not going to go through a list of those. But I will mention that he is the founder and past president of the Association of Laboratory Automation. He is the founding editor of the journal for that particular organization. He is a fellow of the Council for High Blood Pressure Research of the American Heart Association. He's a fellow of the American Association for Clinical Biochemists. And Robin has published more than 260 research papers, has edit, co-edited three books on medical automation. He holds 13 patents and has presented more than 140 lectures in 15 countries. Robin, congratulations. We look forward to hearing your presentation uh, and glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you, thank you. I just get paid to play, is what I like to say. I, I found this quote from Thomas Jefferson because I think it really is appropriate for this new culture of innovation, which we are seeing not just turn slowly at the University of Virginia, but it's a hurricane that's gathering some amazing speed that I'm really, it's a pleasure for me to see in particular. Uh, and it's, I, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find 
the harder I work, the more, uh, the more I have of it. So essentially, you make your luck by just getting out there and doing as many possible things as possible that give you pleasure and productivity, and then the doors seem to open. And that's, I think tonight is an example of that. So I want to thank Eric and the committee for selecting me this year. Uh, it's, I feel it's a, you know, a long time coming simply because the, the culture of the university has been rather static for a while, and now it's nice to see change at a place like this. So I'm going to give a kind of an unusual view of, uh, of my businesses. I thought what I'd do is do a timeline. It is essentially a lifetime of inspired mentorship. You're never really a solo act out there. You're a product of the people that have trained you and pushed you and pulled you and everything it takes to do innovation. And so I started thinking about all the people that made a difference in my life and, and where, you know, where they made pivotal moments in my, in my future. And so uh, I'm going to actually cover the, my entire life from birth to uh, today in 20 minutes. Um, it actually would only take about eight minutes, but I'm glad to add some exaggeration and hyperbole to just to, <laughs> to, to fill the time. So ever since, uh, ever since uh, even before I was born, I was learning about biology and how critical it was to, to life. This is my mother, Roberta, and my father, Pelham, that were responsible <laughs> for my being here. <laughs> They've changed slightly in the, in the last couple of years. Um, and then, you know, the inevitable bio biological event happens, and then, and then you, uh, you get born. But I realized even before I was born that life was going to be intensely competitive, because I had uh, a, a challenge in utero, and that I had a twin that was sharing my space with me. <laughs> and, uh, so we were struggling for oxygen and nutrients and, and space, and it, so I learned really early that you have to kind of go what you have to go with it and, and get what you can. Um, so, but it wasn't just the two of us. There was actually my older brother, who was all three of us within a year, and so that's why my mother looked so young, as she managed to, to take care of three children in such a short period of time. Um, there were times that uh, my mother would feed Chris and I, tw well, Chris twice because he did, couldn't tell us apart until the age of three. <laughs> and so I've subsequently learned that if you give rats starvation diets, they live a lot longer. So I'm hoping <laughs> that that's going to pay off uh, down the road. So there was a gentleman, which I couldn't find him for the life of me, but he was a, uh, in, my, in high school years, he was in, amazingly inspirational because he took the few of us who had in, in, intense curiosity for science off into the bush and taught us how to observe. And that's 90% of success is sitting back and observing and learning from what you see and then trying to find out what nature has taught you or the solutions and putting the two together. So I'll find him eventually and let him know that his early inspiration really ma did make a difference. That was a pivotal moment. Another pivotal moment <laughs> was when I met Mary at the age of uh, late 15, early 16. And uh, without her support for a zillion years, um, I wouldn't be where I am today, you know, in terms of all the, imagine scheduling somebody who's running a professor, professorial job, six companies, traveling and, uh, and giving lectures, and all just seems to go seamlessly. Well, it's the machine behind the machine. <laughs> Another gentleman was amazingly inspirational. In 1976, I used to volunteer my times, my summers at Georgetown University uh, working in the laboratory. Somehow the lab was a draw for me. And so I, I met this gentleman, or he met me, and he was looking for talent. Uh, he was an amazing combination of uh, humor, drive, and uh, intellect, the likes of which I've never seen. And so we teamed up together and started doing science. And ever since 1976, I think we've phoned each other every day have with some new scientific event that we're doing. And I would say he's, we've co-authored about 258 of the 260 papers <laughs> we've done. So one of those amazing people that I hope everybody in life could meet. Uh, then another biological event. <laughs> we had children, Cameron and Carter, in 1982 and 1985, respectively, and they're here. And, uh, and then life goes on. Uh, Andrew Johnson has joined the family as Cameron's husband. So it's really great to see the next generation thinking about their future. And they've got really interesting stories to tell. I would hope you would seek them out and ask them what they're doing in Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
Another gentleman who was pivotal, absolutely pivotal in my career was Robert Carey. He's here tonight with Theodora. Um, you know, they've been sort of adopted me along the way. But I came down looking for a postdoctoral position at the University of Virginia, having already been accepted at the Mayo Clinic. And Robert Carey, I, I'm sure, was instrumental because I, you know, I, I was waiting in the hall all day for the few interviews. I got home, the phone rang again, the Department of Pathology called me and said, we'd like to offer you a faculty position instead of a postdoc. So uh, I jumped right up into, you know, saved five years of servitude and got right, right to business and, and got on with, with life. So Robert has been tremendous, uh, Bob, all these years, and we co currently have a large grant together, and we're gonna solve high blood pressure one way or another. And then another gentleman from Japan, somewhere early in the 1980s, I saw my first robot and fell in love, and that started another whole career. And Dr. Sasaki from Kochi Medical School and I teamed up. Uh, he was holding an annual conference. I was holding an annual conference, and we started this uh, international exchange. I got him exposed to the U.S. because he was the Japanese at that time were trying to break their technology over into the, into the United States. And so I hopefully opened some doors for him. Been a lot of relationships that have developed as a result of this collaboration. Unfortunately, he passed away, but he was a pivotal uh, gentleman in my life. And finally, Dr. Terry Scherer and I met over an event that was funded at the University of Virginia from the Carilion Health System, which is the health system south of us. They were fun funding innovation and biotech development. He was on the board of directors. He and I got to be friends. He was the former health sciences curator for the Smithsonian that collected the first in science and medicine for this nation for 40 years. So he has a mental Rolodex from hell. He knows everybody. He collected Kornberg's wallpaper off of his laboratory. It's just amazing. So Terry and I have teamed up and we, and I'll describe in a, in a moment another pro nonprofit we've formed called Medical Automation. So they're the, the major pivotal people, hundreds others, friends, family that have really made a difference. But the problem was now armed with all this knowledge from these people, what was I gonna do with this? Well, certainly the health system is, is a train wreck right now. It's too expensive, it's ineffective, too many people are dying, it's safer to stay at home than it is to go in a hospital in many cases. So I call that opportunity. And that's what we've been, we've been doing in various aspects of my labs. I started in 1984 when I first arrived, the Medical Automation Research Center, and the longest standing member of that uh, center, he was there from the day one when I recruited him off the lab bench to build gizmos in the back room, and that's Bill Holman, who's, where's Bill sitting? Just raise your hand, Bill, so at least, there he is. <laughs> Former president of the Virginia Beer Brewers Association or whatever, but uh, Bill's a multi-talented guy. <laughs> um, he brought beer to all our parties, it was really important. Uh, <coughs> But we formed a multidisciplinary research and innovation center that focused on inventing and developing cost-justified medical and biotechnologies with emphasis on cost justification. We wanted ROIs that were in the order of months, not years. And we have a website that's still active, but uh, we're gonna revamp that into something new. But we essentially had, at one point, 36 employees, 100% funded by the center. We didn't get any funds from the University of Virginia. Uh, we had a basic science program funded by NIH in the midst of all of this. So we had mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, basic scientists, nurses, physicians, all teamed up together in three conference rooms, and it was a wild frenzy of innovation and activity. If somebody had a, a really good idea, we went to Steve Kell, which I hope he's here, um, and within an hour and a half, we had a working device. That was pre-engineering you know, engineering technology. We, we tore it apart. We had turnaround on finding out if it made sense, and then we launched off if it made, and we'd go to the con business concept competitions at Darden. We always liked to, to test it on the local experts in the area. We did consulting for all the major corporations. That's how we learned what they wanted. We went into think tanks and focus groups within the hospital to find out what the users wanted. And so, and we initiated trade organization and, and international conferences in order to find out what the rest of the world was, was thinking in, in these particular areas. Here's an example of a typical marked project. It was a, a complex robotic system that would catalog human specimens so they could be used for biomedical research and drug discovery. Uh, this is one where we, transportation was an issue within the hospital. It was costing them too much and things weren't getting delivered on time. So we found 
I helped develop a robot on the left. The other one was the product of Joe Engelberger, kind of the, modern, the father of modern industrial robotics. And so we said, let's get all the robots on the planet. Let's them run, let them run all over the building. Not only did they improve service delivery by 30%, but all the local school groups would come into the hospital just to watch these things. So it was a great PR move as well, a little unwitting uh, thing. There's also a, a short video, which I think I have to run from here. system we because robots stop and they say I'm here to service you feed me or take something take something off or put something on so what we developed was a system that would automatically put things on the robot and let the robot take off and deliver it somewhere else three dollars and fifty cents worth of parts the patent is owned by the University of Virginia and this is going to see the light of day when robotics becomes more prevalent so this Flurry of activity resulted in at least nine companies, but I'll just go briefly through a few of them just to give you an idea of the kind of breadth and depth that we were playing with. Uh, medical automation, global cell solutions, well aware systems, Hypogen, RALS, Biofile, and the Association for Laboratory Automation. In order to get information out there, we found that markets didn't <coughs> exist for half of what we were looking at. So what we did is created those markets. The Association for Laboratory Automation was started by essentially putting my house, my house mortgage up for, for risk and rented a hotel in San Diego. And we invited the world to come look, look at laboratory automation. Uh, fortunately, it was a wild, wildly successful. That company, nonprofit, continues to grow with 40% compounded annual growth with about a $9 million income just for, for uh, nonprofit activities. They have conferences which have blossomed now from lab automation to lab fusion to Eurolab automation to SLAS, and they've got a conference now in China. Uh, we created the journal and almost put the ink on the paper right here at the University of Virginia, everything from stem to stern, and that's now read by 10,000 people and translated into two languages. So that's opened up a whole entire market that is the trade show is three and a half acres and has over 400 vendors. So it's created the market that previously didn't exist. So subsequently, I've exited that to start medical automation with Dr. Terry Scherer I described previously. And we held our first conference in Helsinki, Finland in, two, uh, in 2005. Sorry about the number there. Because that's where the cell phone was born and that's where wireless medicine was going to be born. We subsequently moved it to Washington, D.C., and have held it there ever since, and we'll probably move it to Johns Hopkins uh, in, in November of this year. We have a newsletter that goes out to 10,000 people every week. RALS was a system where, in a hospital, all of the nurses and physicians that are using instruments that are not run by professionals can create lots of errors and problems for the laboratory. So we simply connected the laboratory, which is the lower left square with all the things going on in the hospital in real time. And now that product is in 70% of hospitals nationwide and has been sold recently. It still exists in Charlottesville, but Alir purchased medical automation systems. Well Aware Systems was one on home-based wellness. We know that the future is, constitutes hospitals without walls. We are going to have medical care in our homes. So we needed something that was passive personalized, preventative, and predictive, yet resident in your home. No buttons to push, no, no screens to interact with. So an example of that technology is a bed monitor that gets your pulse, breathing, and sleep hygiene or sleep quality. There's a gait or fall monitor that we measure the vibrations in the floor so we can see how elders are walking and we can tell if they're falling and how they're falling. We can dispatch a 911 call in under 30 seconds without the use of human intervention. And then there's a bathroom scale that's still in development that'll determine weight and blood pressure. So all those people who have blood pressure cuffs and never use them, well, you don't have to use them. Just weigh yourself in the morning, problem solved. That currently is in, uh, in, in Richmond with about 35 employees. Biofile was a company that's been sold twice, taking the whole problem of huge numbers of medical specimens and cataloging them at minus 80 degrees Celsius. So it was a robot in a freezer and the lower left picture is where Craig Venter bought 15 of them and used them for the beginnings of the Human Genome Project. Uh, Hypogen is a small uh, pharmaceutical company based on about $35 million worth of research at the University of Virginia, $38 million worth of research at Georgetown and University and Children's Hospital. 
And essentially, we're bringing to market the first convenient diagnostic test for high blood pressure, predictive high blood pressure, and salt sensitivity. Just a brief aside on that, very few people realize that salt is certainly one of the most prevalent substances on the earth, but everybody thinks salt is bad for you. Well, it's far from the truth. For about 25% of people in this room, salt will have very negative uh, consequences. For about 18% of the room, if you reduce your salt too low in your diet, your blood pressure will go up and you'll have the same consequence with somebody with high blood pressure. So what we're going to show here shortly in a paper is that your salt consumption is highly personalized, can be predicted, and you can essentially set your daily salt maximum and avoid all of the consequence of negative, negative consequences of salt. And to do this, we're do, doing basic biomedical research and diving right into the kidney and doing subcellular research. This is a picture of kidney cells and what they look like. The problem is you can't get kidney cells to grow outside the body very effectively. So we invented another technology that is now in a company called Global Cell Solutions, run by a CEO, Uday Gupta, out of the Darden School. And it's a platform which we can grow cells not only for research, but for replacement body parts. And we can do it in an automated, automated and highly factory-like method. And it increases cell quality and relevance to the diseases you're not only studying, but fixing. Uh, so these are the technology platform and the actual biological platform on the left. So to summarize everything I've told you, we essentially looked at market focus, quick to market, quick return on, on uh, the dollar technologies. We looked at cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, asthma, diabetes, and elder care, which essentially is a combination of those. Those are huge markets. If you can't succeed in a huge market, you're, something's wrong. Then we looked at diagnostics, monitoring, and therapeutics, and all our companies fit in there somewhere. They're all making contributions in that grid and hopefully will move up the food chain and start making additional jobs and opportunities in our community. So this is the team that currently is working in, in, our, in our group. Uh, that everybody, almost everybody's represented in the room here and it's a d dynamic group of people. We, we have a lot of fun all day, uh, but this is the, uh, there's a larger, where would, where'd my larger thing go? Hmm. Well, I had a list of everybody, including our students, but, uh, it's, I think there are 20, some odd, 21 people in the lab this summer from undergraduates all the way through. So uh, like most people lecturing in the rotunda, I'll end with another Thomas Jefferson quote, like bookends, one in the beginning, one at the end. No person will have occasion to complain of the want of time who never loses any. It is wonderful how much may be done if we are always doing. Thank you.